Please welcome the panel on Disrupt or Be Disrupted, Venturing into Tech, moderated by Chairman of the Institutional Clients Group at City, Leon Calvaria. I became a better investor. <laughs> okay, I want to be able to see everyone. Great. Thank you, everyone, for coming here today. Um, we title the panel is Disrupt to be Disrupted, Venturing to Tech, or as we've renamed it, The Great Tech Reset. <laughs> I'm honored with this group here, who I'm going to have introduce themselves in a moment, but a few comments from my standpoint here as we start out. From an investor standpoint, technology is still regarded as the absolute best place to invest. As we do our surveys, everyone looks and says, the tailwinds haven't really changed, valuations may have altered, but this is still the place to be. NASDAQ is down 25%, FANG is down 25%, interest rates are up, we all know that. The issue is where do we go here? Private company valuations have seen some stunning changes. Stripe down 45 billion, if you believe the peak number. Shine down 36 billion. Instacart down a large number. We'll see where it ends up ultimately coming out. Baiju down a large number. We'll see what ends up coming out. But there is momentum in the market. People are very excited about some of the trends that we'll talk through here today. And I think that they're looking and seeing that the industry has actually adjusted itself, cutting costs, focusing on profitability, and ensuring that they have a business model that I know some of the panelists will talk about that has a real moat. This is a business that is going to sustain itself and absolutely thrive in the environment that we're dealing with here right now. So a lot of changes, a lot of maturity coming into the industry. But with that, uh, I'd like the panel to introduce themselves, but before they do, I think we're blessed to have this type of panel here, from early stage venture, to late stage growth, to buyouts, to <coughs> global, to a variety of different silos here. I think this panel represents 250 billion close of AUM, and all five of them are very, very prominent investors in their sector. But with that in mind, if we could start out with the exact introductions and then get going. Sure, David? sure. So I'm, uh, I'm David Craver. Um, I'm co-CIO at Lone Pine Capital. Uh, our firm is 25 years old this year. Um, we manage about uh, $14 billion and have uh, both a long-only fund and uh, a hedge fund um, and, a, and a crossover effort as well. So I'm, I'm familiar with and have been investing in private markets for, for several years. So great, thank you. Yep. Um, hi, I'm Anton Levy. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, I've been with General Atlantic for uh, a bit over 24 years. I'm co-president of the firm, and I run our technology uh, investment business, and have run that for the last 17 years or so. Um, and just for context, General Atlantic's. Uh, a growth equity firm um, that's been around for 43 uh, and change years and has just uh, under about 100 billion of assets under management. Thanks, Anton. Hey, everyone. I'm Monty Soroya. Uh, I'm the co-head of the flagship fund uh, at Vista Equity Partners. We're a large buyout shop. Um, we also have a credit arm and a, uh, and a small hedge fund. Um, I've been at Vista close to 17 years. Uh, I co our flagship fund, I sit on our executive committee, I sit on our private equity management committee. I think I sit on all, all the committees that these folks all sit on in their firms. Um, so it's great to see everyone. Oh. Time to stand up. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> this is a little early to start on that. That was the alarm for me to exactly. introduce myself. That was your time was up. Okay. All right. <laughs> you can um, retaliate. I'm Dana Settle, a co-founder and managing partner of Graycroft. Uh, we are a full life cycle venture capital firm based in Los Angeles and New York. Um, we've been around for about 17 years and we manage just over $3 billion. Um, and really happy to be here. And, and, you know, I think about my job as sort of creating product for all these guys to buy. <laughs> Good product. 
Good morning. I'm Mark Stad. I'm the founder of Dragoneer. <clears throat> uh, it's great to see everyone here. These are some very close professional and personal friends. So it's nice to be on stage with you. Uh, I, I started doing what I'm doing in 2007 with $1 million of uh, assets. Uh, and I thought it was all the money in the world. Um, and our model was there's just a tiny number of exceptional companies in the world. You know, companies that have great moats and will make lots of free cash flow, both in the public and the private markets. So when I built Dragoneer, the idea was let's have a flexible pool of capital that can go play public or private, but with the idea really of preserving capital first and having high rates of return second and things that we'll know well and can own them over the long term. And today we have over $20 billion of assets uh, under management and a wonderful LP base and team and keep doing what we're doing. Great. Thanks very much. So let me start out with questions for each of the panelists here and uh, see if we can get some areas of agreement. And I'll go down the line if I may, David. Okay. The big bad wolf finally arrived. Yes. Um, everyone who thought that interest rates were going to be zero forever had obviously a short memory. And we've had some dramatic changes. From your standpoint, especially given the public market focus, how have you seen companies adjust their strategy? What changes are taking place in this environment here right now to start to take into account the massive reset? Well, I think, um, yeah, th th I think the cost of capital has uh, returned uh, and we've uh, normalized levels that, you know, are um, different than we've had over the last, you know, um, several years. Uh, you know, in many ways, companies are shortening duration in how they think about the running their businesses. So they're solving for, uh, solving for profitability and pulling back on uh, investment We've seen a number of the large um, internet companies, uh, you know, do layoffs, rifts, as the industry likes to say, um, and refocus their businesses on on profitability. And that's what uh, that's what capital wants to see them do. Uh, that's what the markets want to see them do. Uh, and I think uh, you know we're going to see dispersion. I have already seen it in the public markets. I think I think you're going to see more of it as we move forward. Um, uh, I'm certain that it'll happen in the private markets as well and is happening in the private markets. Um, so I do think that, you know, we have a reset um, and this is the new state of the world. I don't think we're going back to where we were in uh, 2018, uh, you know, and um, so we all need to adjust and companies are adjusting, you know, as they go. Yeah, no, look, I agree with that. I don't think we're, we're turning to that certainly for a long, long time to come. And the risk capital, Anton, that you have put out, I mean, the firm has been around 43 years, probably the longest, and, you know, unless we look at, uh, at your partner, Dana, in Alan Patrikoff, because he's been around the longest of all of us. <laughs> um, and he's fabulous. Anton, as you look here right now, you recently went into the public markets and did something really significant in terms of mobile eye, investing in the transaction going public, how do you view these valuations as you go forward in terms of allocating public versus private? Do you see the autonomous space specifically in terms of what Mobileye is doing as something very, very significant? How have you all reset your investment mentality going forward given your long history over five cycles? So um, we are predominantly a private market investor and have been for most of the last 43 years. Um, you know, that said, um, where we can do our kind of diligence, which is full due diligence, build a relationship with a management team, um, if that company happens to be on the precipice of going public or a public company, uh, we've made uh, a lot of those investments over the years. Um, and, um, and that's been a successful place for us to to go. Uh, in the case of uh, what happened with Mobileye last October when the company was going public, we had an opportunity to go under the hood. Uh, we signed an, uh, an NDA uh, with uh, the management team. We'd known them for a long time. Uh, we spent two months uh, under the hood of the company and ultimately participated in a concurrent private placement at the time of their, um, their IPO last October. Um, I'll say a couple of things. One, one is that um, I, you know, there's an, a number of incredible technologies and innovations that all of us in this room have seen over the years. Um, one of the things that we try and do is figure out wh where are there great investment opportunities to accompany great innovation. And I think what's going on in the autonomous space uh, broadly 
uh, there was a, and this happens in a lot of different areas, where there's a, an early hype cycle uh, you're seeing in some areas now, um, and valuations get way ahead of themselves. There's articles on every newspaper, on every front page. Uh, and it's not that those areas aren't exciting or transformational, it's just that often the hype cycle is ahead of reality in terms of de delivering real business models, unit economics that work, companies that generate significant cash flow. That happened, we think, in the, in the autonomous area. There was lots of excitement a number of years ago, lots of investment, lots of companies, a lot of them that were failed, lots of capital raised and unattractive values. Um, Mobileye, um, uh, when they were going public in, in really the last couple of years, a lot of the excitement in the autonomous uh, area seemed to wane, and as a result, a lot of the valuations became a lot more attractive. Uh, some of that was driven by the market, but a lot of it was that I think a, a lot of the autonomous rollout is taking longer than, uh, than anyone thought a number mm -hmm. of years ago. Um, but if you actually get behind the data, what's going on in, uh, in autonomous, that whether it's level three, level four, or some of the early innovations around level five autonomous, is that actually there's a lot of progress being made uh, and, and a lot of innovation, and, and a lot of that is much closer to reality than people think. And Mobileye is one of the significant beneficiaries of that. But what we liked about that was this innovation cycle was finally taking hold, a business model was taking hold, they were shipping product, generating unit economics that worked, but a lot of the hype and excitement was off that, and so you were able to get a lot lower risk in terms of rollout at much more attractive values. And, and that's what uh, a lot of what we've tried to do over the years is try and find out where's their interesting risk reward, and we thought Mobileye was... Yeah, um, no, it's, it's obviously very prominent, and, and you know, level five autonomous has been five years away for the last 10 years. And so it's a very, very significant investment that you all end up making here with the real data. And I think, you know, that's a good segue, Monty, into your business. I mean, 100 billion, you've been the most active doing private buyouts in this environment here right now, even high interest rates, an environment that's very, very difficult for some people. But the reality is enterprise software has been one of the best places to invest in, and you certainly have been very prominent in that. As you look at this environment right now, you know, people are cutting costs. Companies are resetting themselves here. What do you think is the outlook from an enterprise software standpoint right now, given potential recessionary issues, potential issues around innovation? Do you view that as a big growth area for you continuing on? Yeah, look, I think for, from our standpoint, we've taken a little bit of a, a different viewpoint for, for buyouts. We don't do buyouts all the time. Um, uh, and you've seen some of our peers tend to do that. And so there was a massive amount of flows and buyouts in 2020 and 2021, we were out of the market for buyouts. We were doing private uh, proprietary deals with founders where we took control. Um, and then in 2022, when the, when the reset happened and valuations start to get back to a normalized level, we look at everything on a growth adjusted basis. And so when you looked at the market in, in, in 20, you know, from 20, we always hear valuations are high. So from 2000 to 2018, valuations felt like they were rising, but they were rising as the growth rates of software companies were rising. And then in 20 and 21, when, when rates were zero and, and money was free, the valuations were far superior to where the growth rates were, were unsustainable. So we just didn't do buyouts. We felt like the public markets had run ahead uh, of where the underlying growth of these businesses were. And then in 22, things came back to normal. I think for us, where we've done a bunch of our value creation, we're very operationally focused, is helping businesses grow profitably, which is basically the mantra of what everyone wants to do today. So I, it feels a little bit like the world has come back to, to what we do best. And so for us, we've done three take privates kind of back to back here in our new fund um, because the valuation discrepancy between public and private is pretty vast in today's yep. market. And we're helping these businesses get more profitable. From a, from a leverage standpoint, we don't do the traditional buyouts where you do massive amounts of leverage and, and very little equity. The vast majority of our, our positions have been equitized. So you know, we're you know, on the way in, we're 85, 86% equity, typically on, <coughs> on our portfolio, and we delevered a you know, single digits leverage pretty quickly. So we're, re we're returning our returns at an unlevered basis. And so for us, the leverage markets don't have a meaningful pull on whether we do buyouts or not. For us, it's truly operational change and the ability to, yeah. to which, help these businesses grow. Which should be some interesting upside if rates come down over time for you to end up going back and then putting leverage on real Agreed. cash flow businesses from that standpoint. Agreed. But you've obviously done a phenomenal job. We'll come back to what people's views are, especially you all, on the uh, investments of what I call the class of 20 and 21, which uh, I think 
lockdown produced some interesting behavior when it came to some of that, and I'll be interested in people's commentary <laughs> about what they thought about when they were sitting late at night having their third drink and looking at investments. <laughs> but Dana, you're the, really the voice of venture here. In, from your standpoint, you know, you and Alan created this firm that has had a long track record in the VC space and in effect being the early stage investor that creates many of the businesses or helps fund the businesses that the folks around here have been, uh, have been investing in. Let me ask you, as you look forward here right now, what do you see as the early stage environment from your standpoint? Are you seeing more and more interesting things? Or on the other hand, given the focus on near-term profitability, are you having difficulty finding the right kind of investments? So um, we, we actually, we, we just closed um, on two new funds and we're thrilled to have done that at this time because we think that in this kind of a cycle, the opportunity set is vast. Um, and, you know, the opportunity set on early stage really in some ways is business as usual. I mean, there are always amazing early stage companies, the you know, sort of technological cycles that we've all heard about, obviously around AI, which I'm sure somebody was counting to see how long it would take us to talk about AI. But um, you know, there, there are gonna be tremendous opportunities. And so um, you know, I think there are seven of the 10 most valuable public companies were venture backed and were started um, and funded in, uh, during within two to four years of a very significant market reset. So, you know, as I think about that, I think the opportunity set is tremendous. Capital has become more constrained in our market, which in our view is a good thing because I think companies, the best entrepreneurs, will be resilient and will really build their companies more profitable from the get-go with a focus on unit economics, with a focus on, you know, how big the market opportunity is. And so we think the opportunity set for early stage, tremendous, a little bit business as usual. In terms of growth, which we also do, um, you know, really, we believe it's about patience and flexibility. <laughs> so if you think about the opportunity set there, some of the companies that were funded in 2021 and, and 2020 when um, capital was very prevalent and, 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 and free, um, there were a number of great companies that were funded. They were just overcapitalized and funded at valuations that were well, way ahead of where the businesses are. So what we're looking for in the growth stage is just spending time with those companies. Companies that we think are gonna go on to be the next you know, 10 largest market cap companies in the world and um, finding our entry point when, whether it's you know, through a secondary, being able to be small or scale up and uh, providing liquidity and or primary capital at fair valuations. But let me just pick up on that point for a minute. You know, I've had so many discussions with people over the years um, with my partner, Paul, who's, who's with me where everyone wants to be a unicorn. I mean, I don't go understand what that exactly meant. And everyone had this fixation. I'm, and I'm looking at, on your side, are people sort of more realistic about saying, I want to build a great company? You know, being on a unicorn list is, you know, irrelevant and I've got to focus on reality. Are you seeing that in people building more carefully at the right price? Yeah, very much. I mean, I think, um, you know, again, when, when sort of the capital becomes more constrained and things get harder. Um, you know, I think you end up with entrepreneurs that again have bigger ideas or solving more challenging problems that a million different people can't do, a very small set of people can do. And so, you know, I think it's both um, that the companies again will be built more capital efficiently. They're going after bigger, harder problems um, and with teams that are really incredible. And so, you know, again, with this technological wave around AI that is also, you know, again, that's sort of on the tails of cloud computing continuing to grow and, you know, open source software and, and mobility and all of these things, I think that we're just going to see such an incredible set of companies, but it's not for the faint of heart. And, and I think that they, the best companies are still going to actually take a significant amount of capital. It's just that they'll be spent on really investing in hard technology versus just customer acquisition on yeah. Meta. Thank you for that. And Mark, last but certainly not least, I'm going through my list here, but you rejected so many questions. I'm having <laughs> trouble with my, 
<laughs> actually having trouble finding something to use. Um, on one note here for, for my colleagues and others, uh, Mark started as an analyst at City. For, so for those people in despair in that role, there is life <laughs> afterwards here right now. Yes. Look, look at where Mark ended up. Congratulations. I mean, Dragonair is just this unique business from that, you know, public-private business, crossover fund, and you have done, I think, you know, some very, very unusual transactions, including having actually one of the best performing IPOs in recent time, which, uh, which is very, very unusual given that the average IPO is down 50%. As you look forward here right now, where's your focus? Is it growth? Is it profitability? What are the competitive dynamics that you're looking for in these companies? Because you will do, along with everyone else here, real in-depth work on the companies. What's your view here as you go forward with this great reset? Is that an allowable question? That's okay. that, that one we'll go with. <laughs> By the way, I, I was an intern at City 23 years ago. Um, it's amazing that you still remember that, um, given I was, I was a summer. But at that time, I, I was convinced I was, had no, no vision whatsoever that I was going to go into the world of finance. I want to go to Washington and, and save the world. And I happened to help write Bob Rubin's who was a co-CEO at the time, endorsed in speech for then candidate Al Gore. And afterwards, he asked me, what am I going to do? I said, go to Washington. And, and his advice to me was, uh, first, go learn something about finance and business. And um, he didn't get me the job, but he got me the interview. Um, and I went down to New York, and um, they gave me a job. And that was my foray, foray into, into finance. So, so thank you to Citi. Um, to answer yeah, your got, question, I've, I've got your HR reviews here. That was probably a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> the question is, did they give me an offer? Um, so, um, to, to answer your question, that's not how we see the world, right? It, it's not profitable versus unprofitable. The question really is, is this a great business or is this not a great business? Are we buying it at a great price and do we know it darn well? And if it doesn't check those three boxes, we just have no interest. There are unprofitable companies. When we invested in Facebook back in the day, you know, it had 777 million of revenue. It didn't have profits. Today, it's, I don't know, tens of billions of dollars of profits. You know, and you can go down the list of, of lots of companies. The question on the profit is really, do the economics work? There are companies that, uh, like in software, in Monty's world, et cetera, that you spend a buck on sales and marketing, you get a buck 20 in the first year back, and that compounds uh, you know, for a while and grows from that number. And that company may be growing very quickly. Guess what? That's a great investment. Similarly, you could have a low margin business that you got to keep reselling to customers every year, and they wake up every once in a while when there's a recession, and they decide they don't want to buy widget X. And that, to us, is a, is a much worse business. So. Um, our whole landscape and view is there are public companies and they're, they're, they're very, very infrequent, but sometimes the really good ones are cheap because maybe they're misunderstood or even easier, we call it ununderstood. Maybe it's a young public company that just went public and just the world hasn't figured it out yet, like a square right after it came public, like an outfolio right after it came public, and many others. Maybe it's a private company and you find a way to invest in it, like a snowflake or a, you know, go down the list. Um, or sometimes you're less certain. And there's an asset class that a lot of people know about, but we've spent time and we've done 18 structured deals where we say, like a Spotify back in 2016, it was a very tricky investment. If, if you go, we, you know, so many people in this room use Spotify now, but back then there was Rhapsody and RDO and Groove Shark and iHeart and forget about Amazon and Apple and Google and everything. But Daniel Eck was so darn good. And the idea that we were going to pay 10 bucks for an album, a digital album, or three bucks for a song on iTunes indefinitely was not going to happen in our mind. Streaming, and then you're going to have to wait and download it. And did you download it? But I want to hear, and you could stream it anywhere you want, whenever you want, 10 bucks a month, all you can eat. We, we were confident that's where the world was going to go. And then Daniel and Spotify had the best chance. So we, we did a structured deal there, which protected our downside, but gave us exposure to the upside, which turned out to be a, 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 you know, a great investment. So our idea is you really got to try to figure out, it's like a jigsaw puzzle. And you, in our world, we play the idiosyncratic game. And 
by doing publics and privates, by doing structured or common equity, but you got to know what a great company looks like. And if you know what a great company looks like and you know what too expensive looks like and you avoid um, the things you should avoid and you make concentrated investments, then we could, you know, then, then you can make a lot of money in most markets. But let me, David, let me pick up on that point. Mm. You know, as I've discussed with some of you all, you know, structured investments is really what's going on right now because many people don't want to put a pin into valuation. Yeah. They want to be in the company, but they want some level of protection until stability hits. David, as you look at it, especially with your, with your public hat on, mm. but also some of your private hats on, mm. how do you look at the valuations at this point in time? Because one of the questions that I'd love other people to comment on that I think is, is important is I see big discrepancies in terms of public versus private valuations in some cases. Sure. And I often view that, you know, the public market usually, with the exception of what Mark was talking about, usually sort of gets it right over time. It may take them a while. Yeah. What's your view as you well, see Well, I think, so, you know, in this cycle, I think there's sort of two stages to how things are going to go. I think we are largely through the public market drawdown uh, associated with interest rates, okay? So I think the inflationary environment has been discounted into uh, particularly very quickly growing companies, and we've seen reversion to normal levels uh, broadly defined for, for valuations. And the question from here is really how are the businesses actually going to perform fundamentally? And so that's the next sector or set stage of this, uh, of this uh, drawdown is what are fundamentals actually going to look like? My personal view is that the private markets just lag where the pub public markets are, and so we're going to continue to see pressure in, in that world. Um, but I think importantly, um, you know, the getting too focused on valuation often misses the forest for the trees, and there's going to be amazing opportunities as we progress through this downturn. Uh, everyone uh, knows that many of the companies on the internet side that emerged from the internet bubble got to, got to amazing prices uh, during that drawdown. There's absolutely going to be more of those uh, uh, types of companies that we are able to buy in the public markets. And so we're a lot more focused on what Mark was describing, which is the competitive advantages of the companies, understanding the unit economics of the businesses and paying what we feel is a reasonable price. And I do think that prices have gotten to be quite a bit more reasonable here in the last several months. Um, and go to sleep and wake up three years from now and you're gonna be very happy with what you've got. So Anton, just picking up on that point, uh, you know, as you know, I spend a lot of my time on our M&A business. And, you know, when I consider the comments that you just made, I sort of think about what do they talk about, the seven degrees of grief, et cetera, and we haven't quite yet gotten to acceptance in the case of sellers. As you think about your business from an M&A standpoint in terms of what you think are right valuations versus where sellers are willing to do here right now, do you still see a gap or do you think that the gap is starting to narrow depending on the company's position? I, I think, um, I can maybe a couple of thoughts. One, one is I, I think that you're in the middle, I think everybody knows this, but you're in the middle of a classic correction here. Uh, and, and the public markets, um, as people are aware, move very quickly, uh, sometimes very violently. The private markets don't. Um, and this has happened in many of the prior corrections that, that we've been through. Whereas the reason, um, some of this may be obvious or not, but the reason the private markets adjust more slowly is that uh, companies don't need to raise money all the time and they're not marked to market all the time. So companies that don't need to raise money uh, are pushing that off. Uh, and so they're, they're keeping their marks at the prior uh, fundraise that might have been a year or two ago when markets were in a very different place. And a lot of those companies in frothy times like 2000 uh, and 20, uh, 2021, uh, their boards were smart enough to say, times are frothy, put in three years of cash flow, have that on the balance sheet. So they raise money at very high values. and so. They're waiting, uh, and they often extended that runway because they reduced costs, tried to become more efficient. And so that runway has extended. A lot of those companies are not gonna raise money uh, until they need to. Uh, and two is when they do raise money, a lot are putting in structure and other things to preserve this artificially high price. So they're putting in you know, pick coupons or you know, multiples of your lick prep. And so it's, again, artificially inflating prices relative to the public companies 
which are typically common stock. <coughs> There's no hiding behind structure uh, for a lot of the public companies. And so all of that is pushing out. And so you're in the middle of this correction, I would say a classic correction, um, and you're kind of on the downslope, and you're probably somewhere between a third uh, and halfway through that correction, in, in, in my opinion, uh, based, on, uh, based on history. Um, but a lot of those companies are going to want to raise capital again, whether it's to play offense and M&A, like you were talking about, uh, or they're going to want to have still a year or two of runway, and now that runway has been depleted. So I think you'll see in the next 12, 18 months, a lot of those companies do deals, um, and, they'll, and they're going to be resets. You've seen it with companies like Stripe recently. These are great companies. Uh, that might have raised money at a high price, and now they're raising money at more, more, uh, more rational prices. And I don't think there's any shame in that. In fact, I would tell you, I think it's in, in companies' interest not to do these structures, not to keep these artificially high prices, because smart employees, smart, sophisticated employees, aren't going to want to work for free. And they're going to realize that their options are struck at prices that aren't a re uh, reflection of reality. So I think all that's working its way through the system. I think that's healthy, uh, as much as it's yeah. uncomfortable to have rifts and layoffs and cost cuts and all that. All this is healthy for the ecosystem. The prior environment was not, uh, was not sustainable. So I guess in closing, I would say, I think people are adjusting their, uh, their views uh, of values. Uh, I think people are comfortable raising rounds increasingly that are closer to reality in terms of market prices. Um, and I think you're gonna see even more of that over the next 12 months. Yeah, and by the way, just a point, and you know, there's some comment too that I've focused a lot on, is obviously stock-based compensation you know, many of these companies had, you know, the employees actually thought that the last mark was reality, and now they're faced with something that is pretty significant. So I think companies will also go through a great reset in terms of their relations with their employees and how they conduct it going forward so that it's fair. Le well, Leon, can I just say one thing on, sure, on Anton's point? In, in, in everything you said, I agree with. Um, in broad strokes, the, the, the only thing I would say is, there were companies, let's be clear, there were companies valued in the billions, venture world at scale, that are going to go to zero, that aren't worth anything. Maybe they'll get bought by someone. But the amount, and, and, and we're probably a third to halfway down on average of where these things will be marked, but the number of companies and people's portfolios that they did in these periods, people doing dozens and dozens and dozens of crypto deals or this deal or that deal, speculation, FOMO investments, whatever it is, in this period, like we saw in 99, 2000, like we saw in 07, and now like we saw in 2020 and 21. And the, the, the number of companies that will end up getting marked from what was maybe a five billion valuation or two billion or whatever the number is, down to close to zero, is a heck of a lot higher than anyone's talking about. You know, I mean, and I've talked about this with all of you, sort of four different categories. Those that can raise money end up doing a structured deal at a lower valuation, or maybe it covers up the valuation. Some, Anton, as you said, use the runway, keep the cash, and, and, and cut costs, as Dara did at Uber going back 18 months ago, and make sure they maintain. Um, some of them will get sold for I don't want to say spare parts, but as product lines. In other words, it's a nice, especially in fintech. And then last but not least, and then Dana, I'd love to hear from you on that too, there's going to be a bunch of companies that just go out of business. There's, you know, goodbye, you know, there'll be no reason for them to exist and no one will want to buy them. Dana, will you can yeah. comment? Yeah, I mean, look, I mean, agree with the, the points for sure. Um, but what we really, when we think about it, we're looking for 10x founders and entrepreneurs, right? And, and, and these are folks who are, incredibly resilient. So yes, I agree. There will be companies that go to zero. And I think that's something that isn't being talked about enough. Um, and I think it's even further exacerbated by AI, because I think that there are companies that understand it and are embracing it and are thinking about what it means for their businesses and have already been doing that for the last 12 months, not just, you know, since ChatGPT was released um, publicly. And those that, that aren't and don't have the technical talent to even really be able to sort of think that through. And so, you know, when we look at our own portfolio and when we look at companies, um, you know, existing companies, new companies that we're backing, we're really looking at it through that lens. And I think, um, I, I, I don't think that it's overhyped and I don't think that AI is anything like crypto, which we didn't touch for the record. <laughs> um, I, I think it is, it is really fundamental. And I think, I mean, we're gonna see more things like Microsoft's earnings going through the roof, partially driven by, um, you know, revenue associated with AI. Uh, and, and things like Chegg, which, you know, today 
talked about the fact that their business is down significantly yep. because of ChatGPT. So I, I, I really think, but these, the best founders, they move fast on these trends. And so, and they're able to move from the, the product that they start with to building a full company and, you know, sort of moving into adjacencies that make sense and being nimble. And so, you know, I mean, we're thrilled when we see founders coming to us and saying, I had to cut this business. I have to, I'm going to proactively make all these cuts and I'm moving here. And we see that, we back up the truck. Yeah. Could I just make yeah, one, I to, one comment on the yeah. founder thing? Because 90% of the deals we do in buyouts are founder led because we do only software, which probably sounds counterintuitive to folks in the room. The one thing I think we, we've talked a lot about valuations. The thing that no one's talking about is so even if you get runway, who's going to teach these founders to run profitable growth companies? Yeah. And no one's really doing that, right? So there's not like a public board outside of maybe Mark, you know, yelling at one of his CEOs from a, at, at a board meeting. Like, how are you going to teach these folks that have actually never run in a profitable way in their entire careers to all of a sudden say, okay, now you're going to run a profitable business. It's not just like go fire 20% of the people. Which people are you firing? How are you going to get back to growth? How are you going to navigate the environment? How are you, how are you doing customer acquisition? How do you think about services and support? Who do you partner with? All of these boring things that, that, that founders have to worry about outside of the 1% that are going to break through it and figure it out on their own, and they're the 1%, and so that's who they are. The 99% of the founders don't have a way of navigating this new world, the world which we're going to live in likely for the next you know, 20 years. M Monty, I mean, that was, to be honest, that was exactly the point that I was going to get to as a comment for all, for all of it. You know, I meet with many companies, I think Anthony and I have discussed this, which is many of them do the hard things well and the easy things badly, is the way that I phrase it, which is they're great entrepreneurs, they have great vision, they, they do things that certainly I could do 1% of, but when it comes to actually managing the business, the wheels come off. And not because they, they're bad people, but they don't have the experience. So with that, I'd love to turn to the panel on a general question right now. In management teams, how do you end up coaching these teams? How do you work with these teams in a way that both respects what they've done, but also gives them the guidance uh, to help them going forward here? Mark, do you want to yeah. take that? I think we, we got to think about, so first of all, what Monty said, the Vista model is an awesome model. And, there's, and it blows my mind when, when I read about a take private that Vista does in a company that had X margins as a public company, three years later under Vista's ownership, the EBITDA margins have gone from 15 to 40. I mean, that is a skill set and that is value add and that's how you create a lot of alpha and why Vista's done great. That's their model and no one does it better. The second thing I would say is there's just over, I think just over 100 companies in the world that have a valuation of 100 billion or more. So it's not that many. It's amazing. You rock around Silicon Valley, everyone says they're going to be worth 100 billion dollars. There's been 100 in the history of mankind on the planet Earth. So it's not that easy. Those 100 were not owned by private equity, right? So there are, you call it the 1%, there are amazing founders that figure this stuff out over time, look at into it. Look, at, I mean, there's lots of companies um, who figure it out over time without necessarily needing that level of coaching or ownership. So I, I'll just give one example. Um, you know, I we've been very intrigued by consumer internet. You know, just I remember it was in 2010 when we first did Facebook. Um, uh, I think the cumulative market cap of consumer internet globally was under a trillion dollars. I believe when I looked this up a year ago, it was over seven or eight trillion dollars. So there's been seven trillion dollars created just in consumer internet, give or take, over, over the last 10 or, 10 or 12 years. And when you see that kind, and, 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 and by the way, these companies, so many of them, are wildly profitable, right? Due to the beautiful business model and economic model. The example I want to use is Airbnb. So Air, you know, when you look at these consumer internet companies, they're run by, I call them superheroes. They're just rare. They're rare individuals who figure out how to build really, really big companies with really, really good businesses. Airbnb, COVID hits, Brian Chesky wakes up and says, oh my, my revenues have just gone down by 100%. No one's booking lodging two weeks from now. What do I do? I have all these employees, I have all these costs, and I only have so much money. He quickly raised some money 
to make sure he, he, he could withstand whatever the storm was that nobody knew was coming. And the second thing he did is he, he, he consolidated, you know, I think it was 25% or whatever of the employee base. He rationalized it and he's done that since. You take a company that was unprofitable just four years ago and I think today it has over 30% EBITDA margins. One person, good leadership, good decision making. You see that at Etsy when Josh came in and, and so on and so forth. So I think the answer is we're in the year of rationalization and optimization. It's why software is hard right now. If you're selling to companies who are trying to be rational and optimized, it's hard for them to spend a bunch of money. But what an amazing time for consumer internet who have good business models. This is the year of AI, everyone says. This is also the year of the riff. This is the year of let's get productive and we ain't uncool if we don't give you lunches five days a week. We're kind of uncool if we have a bunch of people around here who are creating dilution for everyone else and we don't need them. And that's the year we came in and that's the beauty. And why we'll come out of this, when we come out of this, with higher margin business. We, we ain't uncool. <laughs> uh, is that? <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna steal your we, e <laughs> we ain't uncool. <laughs> we ain't, we ain't, ain't uncool. <laughs> well, I mean, look, look picking up, and I, I, wa I wanna touch on it with these folks here right now. I mean, the reality is, you know, these were companies who in many cases, um, cutting costs meant slowing growth as opposed to cutting people, going through very, very painful things. But on the other hand, you know, you look at Meta, I think the stock's up 70% this year, and they went through a painful process, and they did their own reset. But I want to keep prodding on the management team side of this issue here right now, because at the end of the day, you all provide capital, but capital is a bit of a commodity. It's also you provide yourselves in the value add. I'd love to hear from both of you all how you look at it. Maybe Anton, starting with you, because I know that you all. Well, I'll just very build on what Mark and I think maybe a bridge. So I was uh, lucky enough to be on the Airbnb board uh, when Brian was going through this. Um, and um, Brian is an amazing um, leader, as Mark said. Um, but he also had a lot of people around the table that were giving him advice, uh, myself the bottom of the list. But, <laughs> you, um, but, but the, the truth is that you develop a relation. I think it was a question you were going through originally, yes. which was, how do you help influence founders? And a lot of it is by building trust. I mean, I think there's two ways. One is you have control of the company, which Monty does, where he says very nicely, you need to do this, and then he says, you're going to do this. Uh, hey, all my funders, 90% <laughs> of my funders are still with me, so it's, I'll just say that. Um, or you build a relationship and you build trust over time. So ourselves, we're about 80% of what we do are minority investments. Um, and um, the way that you build uh, trust and credibility is by building a relationship, talking about ideas, and ultimately to the point where the, the executive trusts you and will listen to you and they know you have their best interests in mind. Uh, and, and that's what typically happens. I know Mark does that, Monty, even though I make fun of him, does the same thing with their things and so does Dana and, and, and others here, which is you build a relationship and you build trust to the point where they're calling you for advice all the time. It's not just at board meetings. Right. It's, hey, will you interview this new CFO or, hey, what do you think of this, this new business line or, hey, should I invest here or not? And you develop a relationship where it's very much an interactive relationship. And most of our CEOs, I'm talking to where I'm the lead investor, I'm probably talking to our CEOs once or twice a week. Uh, yeah. And that's very typical, it'll be you know, on his or her way home from the office, they'll dial me on speed dial and be like, hey, I just wanna run some things by you. And that's the best kind of relationship. And the, you know, even the, great, the greats that, that Mark talks about, um, the, the 1%, but even bigger than that, you know, they're getting advice. These are curious people that understand that they don't know everything. I mean, as soon as the CEO, I mean, Brian would be the, you know, again, to continue the Chesky example, Brian would be the first to say, I don't know what I'm doing. This is the first time I've done X, Y, or Z. Um, and he's, he's very humble about, you know, what he knows and doesn't know. And he takes lots of input and then he makes the decision and he makes it definitively, but takes lots and lots of input. And I think those are really a lot of the best entrepreneurs, best founders. But, but, that, but that's very special. Uh, you know, I work with a lot of chief executives and some people coming in new and I often tell them there's three things under your control. What's the strategy? Who are the direct reports? And last but not least, who are you going to listen to for advice? Mm. Who are you going to distill your advice to? Because everything else sort of gets out of your control. But then you get to, and, and just listening to you, Anton, and, and I want to focus in, I also can call it constructive activism. In other words, and that's why I'm turning to you on the public side of yeah, the yeah. equation, as opposed to you know writing poison pen letters. This is different. Yeah. How do you look well, at it? Well, we, we are not an activist investor. I, I've found that uh, typically when uh, a management team wants to do something that, that I don't agree with, the right answer is for me to sell the stock and buy 
one where the management does agree with, with, with what I want to do. Um, we do. We do a lot of diligence, uh, both in the private uh, investments that we do and, and, and in the public markets on our management teams. And uh, there is a consultative relationship that I have with many of our CEOs. The most important thing for me is to understand their business acumen, and I can provide them some perspective on what's happening in the world around them, but uh, the willingness to adjust on the fly the strategy that they have in place, uh, which is evidenced by some of the examples that, you know, Brian Chesky and others that were just uh, referenced, uh, is very important to me. And, um, uh, uh, yeah, many of the biggest investments we have at the firm, uh, I'm on a first name basis with the person that's running the company. So, look, with that, before I get to a few last, last, uh, last thoughts and questions here, we have some questions from the audience here, which uh, anyone can pick up here right now. Um, starting out with uh, something that's near and dear to, to many of our hearts, when do you all expect the tech sector IPO business to pick up here right now? How do you see that evolving? Would anyone care to take that? Especially with a public hat Yeah, I, I mean, I, I would, I am anticipating that um, this fall will be, uh, there, there will not be much in the way of action this fall. Uh, I, I'm guessing that um, fall of 24 is when we're going to start to see things pick up in a more fulsome way. Uh, at that point, we'll, we'll have worked through whatever we're working through from an economic drawdown standpoint. My guess is that the Fed will have uh, begun to cut and, uh, and there'll be more liquidity in the markets. Uh, I do believe, and it took us quite a while in this panel to get to the subject of AI, uh, you know, I think that we're uh, in 1998 in, in AI relative to what the internet became, uh, and I think that there'll be a frenzy at some point in the next, you know, two or three years of, of IPOs, and money's just going to chase that opportunity in a very aggressive way. Um, I don't see it this year, though. I think that's going to be a 24 event. Any other thoughts from other panelists? Yeah. Mark? We, we spend a lot of time looking at the IPO market. Actually, if, if you have to pick, from our perspective, the best time to invest in a public company is actually the first year after it's gone public. Sometimes it's around the IPO because people weren't, were too busy doing something else. Sometimes it's six months after the IPO because there's a lockup expiration and a bunch of stock is dumped in the market and it cr creates a supply demand that's, uh, that's great for the buyer. Um, and in terms of when it, when it comes, well, first of all, I think there's going to be a big IPO this week. Isn't J&J &J spinning uh, a business off? J&J of, spinning off their business. Yeah, it's a $4 billion IPO. So we're having one this week. But when, when does it come back in mass? When does it come back in tech? My guess will be sooner uh, than that. It will be kind of within, within the next 12 months. Um, but everyone in this room should pay attention. When the IPO market comes back, that's the best time. Why? First, the best... You, the banks aren't going to take the worst companies first. They're going to take the best companies first. You want to avoid the IPO market late in a cycle. You want to be all over it early in the cycle. Remember when Facebook had its flop of an IPO, what was the first IPO after it? ServiceNow. Guess what? Amazing company. And what happens other than they're great? They come out cheap. And that's up, what, 20 times, Dave? You'd know better than me um, since then. So it'll come. When it comes, people will be too busy worrying about their portfolio and other things. But those who are laser focused, they'll find some great companies and the banks will ensure that the buy side uh, does well and, every, and, and there's nothing better for everyone than when an IPO happens and it goes up and to the right. I mean, maybe with Square undervalued at nine bucks and now that's 60, maybe, no one's complaining. Yeah, no, I think that that's right. I mean, obviously we're conscious as are our partners. They have to perform well for the investors because impaired IPOs tend to take a long time to dig out of, as you all have seen. Sure. Anyone else care to give their view on that, Anton? Yeah. I think there's, look, the, you know, the only thing I think the comments are, that make sense, but the, the, the IPO market for great companies is, is open a lot, right? You saw Mobileye go public last October in a terrible market. I mean, again, people like ourselves are beneficiaries of that. So I think you'll see great companies. And at a lower value than had been a, talked about. At an attractive value. and. Um, and, and, and that's, a, I think, a positive for everybody. And maybe Intel took a little bit extra dilution than they might have otherwise wanted to. Um, so I think you'll see great companies go. I think there'll be some interesting companies that go in the next 12 months. A bunch that have been talked about, companies like Databricks and others, I think you'll potentially see tap the market sooner. I think the, 
the, the extreme of the, the very large open market that we had uh, in 2021, I think is unhealthy actually. So I, I don't think you're gonna return to uh, those markets. And I think there's you know, a lot of those companies that went public that shouldn't be public companies. Um, and I think people like Monty and others will, will go shopping uh, in the years to come and help fix those companies and consolidate. And I think there's still a lot of cleanup that needs to be done in that market. But I think, um, I think there's, a, there's, there's a balance and an equilibrium and I think you know, I'm somewhere where these guys are, probably 2024. Um, feels like there's going to be a lot of backlog. I mean, there's a lot of great companies that uh, exist in the private markets um, that are going to want liquidity and all the good reasons to go public. And I think that backlog is building. Um, and uh, I think you're going to see, you know, a really healthy, but hopefully not 2021 public market company. Yes, I take it. I don't need to go to the second question yet. Do you see the SPAC coming back? <laughs> <laughs> We hope not. No, I mean, in terms of what you looked at it, because, I mean, the issue really is, I think, picking up on your point, which is people are going to want to have companies that go public that are going to be viable public entities one, two, three years out here right now. So I think there's going to be a real, real focus on getting high-quality names out sooner, and those names will be priced. I don't want to say priced to sell, but priced attractively for all concerned, if that's a fair way of putting it. So I think that environment is going to be very, very different. Um, one sort of separate question here right now, which someone may or may not care to say, the real estate sector. Do you see this as getting interesting from a venture standpoint to invest in? Obviously, we've had some, uh, we've had some problems in that when real estate companies attempted to portray themselves as tech companies. Does anyone see that as being interesting? I take it not. <laughs> talking about companies like, like, you're talking about companies like WeWork and others? Yeah. I don't think those were ever tech companies. I mean, I, you know, I think they're are good businesses, but you know, I think WeWork was never a technology company. Totally um, so I, I guess I would take issue with whether you're putting those in the tech category or not. I mean, I wouldn't put it in the tech category. They're uh, where I check from. They're in the leasing business and the rental business. But that's the, but prop tech will continue on. Uh, one last question from the audience before we get to our wrap up here. Stan Druckenmiller, apparently, who's a fabulous investor in 2021, said we're in the second of nine innings in cloud and cloud-based services. How do people feel about that? Any commentary from anyone on the panel on that? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, my personal view is that's right. I mean, when you just look at the migration from uh, on-prem to cloud, we're in yeah the second or third inning of that long-term trend. We're gonna go through what Mark described earlier, which is uh, you know companies are, are rationalizing their spend and, and managing against a more difficult economic environment, but the, the long-term trends of, uh, of all of that moving into the cloud are in place as far as we're concerned, and um, we have a number of investments that are going to benefit from that over the ensuing you know, three to five years. So yeah. could I, can yeah. I answer yeah. the cloud question a little differently where there's the cloud providers and infrastructure, right. but the actual software companies being created now are much differentiated from the ones that we were investing in 20 years ago, right? So if you look at the companies we were buying in enterprise software, they were basically automating processes that were manual. Like CRM is basically the same way you sold. As it, it, instead of doing it on a piece of paper, you put, typed it into a computer and that re, you know, reports to your boss. And now the fact that compute is so cheap and accessible and, and widely usable by everyone, you're seeing software companies that are creating solutions that weren't even thought of 10 years ago, right? So we, we're buying businesses that are, look, you know, one of our security businesses looks at a billion data points a second in a network. Right? The fact for us to be able to do that from a compute standpoint, that would have cost us 200 million of infrastructure yeah. five years ago. Today we're able to do it for pennies because we have access to AWS and Azure and the other local cloud providers. So I think cloud is early innings, not just in infrastructure and rolling what you have into the cloud, but the actual creation of software that wasn't even thought of earlier to solve problems that are much more complex. Well, and, and, it's, and it's required, right? I mean, I, mean, I think it's, it's not a, an option. Yeah. It's, it's not an option, and from your standpoint, Mark, it's an accelerator in terms of some of the different f software platforms right now because there's capabilities that didn't exist. As you said, early stuff was simply a typing exercise of transfer. Right. We're now actually having a true computing cycle, and that should be very, very good. Le so Leon, on, on this question of cloud, just two things. One is markets are volatile. They get too hot, they get too cold, right? I mean, it's just, they were too darn hot. but. Software is getting quite cold, and it's going to keep coming up in the numbers until we come out of the economic cycle. And that's why you got to pick when you enter some of these public software companies. However, 
you know, it makes me think we have a company called Point Click Care. They do software for skilled nursing facilities. There's 18,000 skilled nursing facilities in North America. They have 70% of it. No one's ever heard of this company, and it's going to do over four or five hundred million of revenue with very high margins, et cetera. The, 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 if you run a skilled nursing facility, to have software to do your revenue cycle management, to do your electric medical records, what AI could do to a company like this, when you're trying to ensure you know, uh, patients take their meds at the same time, and then you don't put it in a piece of paper, and then you tell the, the, the child, you know, here's the piece, you, know, you, you could send it to them with software. The number of industries, of verticals, that will benefit from being, from just technology showing up is, Stan is 100% right, we're early, and the good news is everyone on this panel is gonna benefit from this, so long as we buy them at the right price. And the good news is they're showing up. Yeah, it, it's not an option, obviously, from that. It, it becomes absolutely mission yeah. critical. So look, um, firstly, I wanna, We've got a few more here for you all, not quite done. I want to thank ChatGBT because they did all the questions. <laughs> and, 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 it, and actually, their work is pretty superb from my standpoint. Um, what I'd like to do is close with a quick lightning round that's not optional. In other words, we, and, and it's long, short, no explanation. And I'd like to just go down the line here right now, long, short. As we go, and, and by the way, I know you'd asked me before, the time frame is 12 months out, so no excuses on time frame. Uh, Ten-year U.S. Treasury. Um, long. 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 I'll go long. <laughs> well, this 250 billion here. They want, they want to hear what you think. I'm a rule breaker. I, I, I don't predict. I don't predict that kind of stuff. You can't. Oh, Jesus. Short, long. <laughs> same, same thing. Channel me. But I have no clue. Mark didn't clear that question. That was so predictable. This gives the people a feel. That was so predictable. But look, <laughs> relating to your investing, uh, S&P 500, 12 months out, long, short. Long. Neutral. <laughs> <laughs> what, what used to happen to you? I want to have Mark, Mark answer no, that question yeah. for me. You don't need a copy, Mark. <laughs> Mark. Uh, I think long. I'm a private investor. <laughs> okay. You, no you, clue. You, no clue. All right. That's very good. I didn't know no clue was an answer. I would have given no clue. I mean, no clue Doesn't not, matter. No clue was not an option. Okay. Let's give you some. Let's go to some other ones here right now because you're so difficult. Um, Bitcoin. Bitcoin. What? Long, short. That was the question. Uh, if, yeah, I, I, uh, sh short. I, uh, when someone gives me uh, some functionality in crypto that you can use it for anything, then I'm interested. But otherwise, it's just a speculative instru agree, instrument agree. to me. Short. What's well, Bitcoin? Okay. <laughs> so that presumes short. Not a crypto investor. Sh short only because Charlie Munger said so. No clue. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, one, two more, to not to let you go with that, the metaverse and augmented reality. Short. Um, very long augmented reality. Short. It's 12 months, right? So short. Oh, we're just 12 months? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the time frame was 12 Well, you can, you can make it longer term. I mean, this uh, is a longer long term. Long term. Uh, long. Then you can... People, people live in the real world. I mean, I think we're seeing it right here, right now. Okay, oh, so that I'm I'm very long. I have a ten-year-old. He doesn't want to live in the real world. <laughs> no, I, it's it's the, the the things that the metaverse can do for people as we live not purely in a, in a real world world is going to be quite powerful. Um, very long. Okay. But also augmented reality, just for what it's worth, is both. I mean, it's it's yeah. not just in, a, in in the metaverse. So I'd, I'd separate metaverse from augmented reality. <laughs> augmented reality. I know, is, but I thought it was mix. too complicated for most of the people <laughs> on the panel. So I didn't want to <laughs> uh, okay, last. This is question. the longest lightning round ever. It's <laughs> a long story. Last <laughs> question. Stop. Last question. Uh, this is you. Work from home. Uh, short. 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 Hybrid. Hybrid. I've been good. Thank you, everyone. We appreciate that. And thank you, thank you, thank you for all the hard work in the panel. Thank and you. thank you to the audience. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed the discussion. Please make your way to the next session.
We gratefully acknowledge